Okay, so hi guys, this is Joe, um, realestatestudies.com with our webinar. Just so we all know, so we're on the same page, I am recording this, so if anybody has a problem with me recording this, please don't continue. So first thing, we are recording. Other than that, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. So before we get going, a little quick pitch for myself. So I don't know if you guys have seen the post, but I started this page uh, called Prep Agent. Designed it, took a lot of time to make it pretty. I hope you guys like it. Doesn't it look fancy? Very fancy. Beautiful. Very fancy. Love it. So before we start the webinar, I was talking to Kristen and Pam about getting your real estate career going before you pass your test. And there's certain things you could do, such as start your Facebook page, start your Twitter. I have all the online marketing tips here. So YouTube, email marketing, Facebook, Twitter. And I hope to start a webinar soon to help you guys get going with those initial items. And I hope you guys will join with that. So please check out the websites on my marketing tips. And if you want to do some real estate exam preparation, I also do blog posts to discuss all the different types of subjects that come up in your exam. So we have easement by necessity here. And I try and make them really fun and short with colorful examples and videos so everybody could see. So please take a second to check out that website. I think it will really help you guys to pass your test, get courses, and get going. So like always, my goal is to help you guys get off the ground. Once you're superpower real estate agents, you don't need me anymore other than to send me a thank you card with a present on my birthday. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. Let's get going with today's subject matter. So today we're talking about appraisal. Okay. So... When you guys think of an appraisal, what do you think of? It's an evaluation of a certain item. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an evaluation of a certain item. All right. There's three types of appraisal approaches you guys study for your exam. Have you heard them? What are they? Market data approach. Good. Income Kristen. data approach. Okay. Kristen, did you hear of one? So you got the market yes, that the comparative market analysis. Good. So that's like the market data. Good. Yeah. The other one that comes up is the cost approach. Okay. We'll talk yes. about it in a second. But the big one and the most important one, which both of you guys named, is the market data approach. Okay. That is one you have to know not only for your exam, but for when in life, when you start practicing real estate. Super important. You'll hear it different ways. Like, Kristen, what did you say? You called it market data sales comparison? The comparative market data approach. Yeah, you'll hear it a lot of different ways. Sales comparison, comparative market data approach. But really, when you look at it, the name is the definition. What I mean by like the name is the definition, kind of like jumbo shrimp, right? I mean, what's jumbo shrimp? Big shrimp. What's the market data approach? You're comparing data in the market, market data comparison approach. So when you look here at these houses I have a picture of, 400 grand, 400 grand, 400 grand. If there's a, a fourth house, what's that one going to be worth? If it's the same. 400 grand. Right. And that's the market data approach. You're comparing all of them. This is important because this is the approach you're going to use as a real estate agent. Okay. So when you're a real estate agent, this is how you find the properties. Do you guys do this approach already without being a real estate agent? Yes. Yeah. When I, when I shop every day. <laughs> there you go. And you're right on with my next oh. example. How much is the third pair of shoes worth? $40. $40. Right? So you're saying it looks the same as those, so it must be 40 bucks. Okay? So you guys use this approach every day. All right, looking at houses. What's the problem with this approach, though? What's the big snafu? If a house is slightly different? Yeah, the problem is they're not all the same. Okay? Right. Everything's got of things are a little bit different. Um, so when you go look at open houses every day, what do people say? Oh, that one has a pool. This one doesn't. This one has a red roof. This one doesn't. Clearly, my pool's worth a million dollars. No, it's not. That's a crappy pool. It's worth $10. You know, everybody has a different perspective. 
and putting a value on those things that they add, like pools, as my cartoon illustrates, makes this approach very, very difficult. And that's why it's not perfect. And I didn't understand this when I first started practicing real estate. I always said, how do the agents know the value? How do they know how to price the properties? How do they know? How do they know? I used to ask my mentor, Maple, the lady in my Facebook post, said, how do they know? And she said, well, you compare properties, you deduct for the appreciation, you deduct for the extra things like pools and whatnot, until she finally gave me the brief and said, they don't know, right? Why don't they know? Because you never know exactly how much things are going to cost. It's always kind of a guesstimate, if you will. All right. So the principle they use in the market data approach is called the principle substitution. Have you guys heard these principles in your studies? Principle of substitution, principle of contribution, principle of regression? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the big one that comes up is the principle of substitution. Once again, it is what it is. Can you substitute one property for the other? Okay. So this one's 100 grand. That's one 750 grand. I'll take the property at 750 grand. I'll substitute it for the 100 grand property because it's cheaper. And much like the shoes, same concept. Go there, take the $75 shoe. So you have to know the key principle is the principle of substitution for the market data approach. It's a comparable if I can substitute it for the property in question. Okay, so here we go. Here's a question for you guys. What do you guys think the answer is here? I say A. A. Okay. Yay! And that's my pool example there. It just mm -hmm. the difference is when I said one guy thinks the pool is a million dollars, the other guy thinks it's ten bucks. There never really is a true answer. What's really the true value of a property? The land? No. Whatever somebody will pay for it. Wow. Okay. At the end of the day, it's whatever a ready, will enable buyer will pay. Now, a little flashback. Both of you guys are in my webinar a few times back. Here's a question to see who is listening. Are you guys ready? I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> How do you know you have a ready, willing, and able buyer? How do you know you have somebody who's serious about their offer? Oh, I do know. I do know. I do know. You, do want you guys to have... remember my example of the marriage proposal? <laughs> the ring? <laughs> the ring. What oh, does yeah. that ring represent? What did that ring represent? Um, that... Good faith. It's on the tip of my tongue. I can't say it. <laughs> the deposit. Remember the deposit. Yes, the escrow. Yeah, don't tell deposit. me you're serious. Show me you're serious. How do I know you're serious? Yeah. You're giving me money. You know, Show me or money. something of value. And we use the example of the engagement ring when somebody proposes to get married. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what's the answer to this one we got here? Underline the market approach. Substitution. Kristen, what do you think? Uh, I was thinking B. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? No. Substitution. Remember, that's the principle of substitution. What it takes to substitute one. That's, that's right. That's yeah. right. All right, got that one. Okay, so we just talked about the principle of substitution, right? Yes. But when you go to a shopping mall, or let's take it even simpler, a shoe store or a restaurant, okay? Can you do the principle? Of, uh, can you do the market data approach and use the principle of substitution? Well, you can compare um, different items, like you've compared the shoes. You can find the same shoe maybe in a different store right. uh, for less. So that would be appraising the shoe. But when we're appraising the shoe store, you think, well, do I really care if it's similar looking in size and square footage to the store next to me? Not really. What I really care is which one is selling more shoes. So what the capitalization income approach does, and you see this with shopping centers as illustrated here, 
a little low there. Let me bring that up. Is it converts that income into value. So if there's a shopping center where every store is thriving, selling a ton of shoes, wouldn't you pay more for that than if it's a shopping center where none of the stores are selling at all? Yes. Yeah. And that's why you see shopping centers, they want the stores to do well in their center. Because if I'm looking at buying that shopping center, what am I going to ask? And they're like, well, how do the stores do here? If the people who own it say, oh, they're all bankrupt, they don't sell anything, do I want to buy that shopping center? No way. No way. So that's an extreme example. So what the capitalization income approach is tries to take that idea and put it into a concrete value, concrete being the best they can. Because obviously that's extreme. If they're not selling anything, you don't want to buy it. If they're selling a ton, you want to buy it. But what is a ton? What is not anything? That's that income approach. It converts income into value. And where would this come up the most? In a shopping center. All right, here we go. Here's a question. Capital, capitalization, capitalization approach. 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 <laughs> you guys are starting to race. Capital, capital approach. Yeah, me. Yeah. Okay, capitalization approach. Good. All right. All right, before I go on to the next one, as I accidentally glanced there for a second. So market data approach says if there's one house, the house next to it can be used to determine the value. But what if there are no houses next to it? What if it's some weird house in the middle of vacant land that goes on for a, thousands of miles in our fictional world? Can you use the market data approach? Yes. Well, no, there's no other houses. Yeah. There's none to be seen. Okay. Um, can you use the income approach for that? No. No. Now, obviously, my example of a house in the middle of an area with thousands of miles around it with nothing near it, that's not realistic. But what is a building that does not bring in income and does not have a comparable property in a reasonable distance to it? Think about that. Hmm. What kind of a property would not have a comparable or bring in income? What do you guys think? Oh, gosh. Should I give you the answer? Please. All right. Kristen, you want the answer? Yes. Okay. Schools, police stations, libraries. See, I was thinking a church. Church, that would work too. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that would work too. Mm -hmm. You get the idea. These types of community buildings are great examples of this because the purpose of these buildings is not to bring an in income. And typically these buildings have about one per town. And obviously in a different town, it's a totally different demographic you know, for price of property, finances, et cetera, et cetera. So schools, police stations, uh, religious centers, things like that. How would you find the value of that property? What would What's you the do? Cost approach. Okay. So what does the cost approach do? So if you say the full name, much like the market data sales comparison approach, the cost replacement approach, what, what are you, what are you doing here to find the value? You're reiterating what it would cost to replace or rebuild that particular uh, building, whatever it may be. Exactly. Perfect. So what would it cost to replace it brand new? Okay. And okay. these are special purpose properties. Okay. When we talk about them in real estate, we're talking about special purpose properties, libraries, schools, police stations, not thinking of other examples in my head right now, but you get the idea. Okay. okay, so you have the cost replacement approach. Let me shift this up here so we can all see. So what is the flaw? Now, all these appraisal approaches have their own flaws. That's why they don't work for all properties. And once, like I said before, none of them are perfect. They're all an estimate of value. 
So what do you think is the flaw with the cost replacement approach? As Kristen said, you're finding out the cost to replace it brand new. What's the issue with that statement there, right there? Let me ask you guys this. When was the last time you've seen a brand new library? I don't think I have. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm sure they exist. There's brand new libraries. But the problem with this approach, these properties aren't new. You know, they're not new. They're old, especially the type of buildings we're talking about, library, schools, police stations. They tend to be pillars of the community, meaning been there around a long time. So naturally, this approach will set the upper limit of value because you're replacing it brand new, even though the property's not brand new. So you're really kind of estimating up. So therefore, this approach would work better for a new property, not an old one. The older it gets, the harder it is to find the, to replace it with the same utility. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the cost replacement approach works better for a new property, not an old one. Because you have to replace it with the same utility, especially because many of these things in these buildings aren't even used anymore. Gosh, me being an internet guy, I'm thinking libraries aren't used anymore. Well, we'll get into that another time. I don't want to announce that I don't go to the library. That just makes me sound stupid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when was the last time you guys been to a library? Anybody been to a library anytime soon? Don't worry, your kids are. <laughs> Do you guys know where your local library is? I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> yes. I pass it. Right. Kristen, your giggle says, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm still like a book. What's that? Is that like an iPad where it's like non interactive? <laughs> right. So I can... right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. So here's the question for you guys to look at. I think it would be B. B, cost approach. Excellent. What type of property would you use for the market data approach? Homes. Residential. What type of property would you use for the capitalization approach? Shopping centers. Good. Okay. All right. Yay, gross rent multiplier balloons. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So I did Price divided by rent. Yes. Oh, you're you're ahead of me. Good. Okay. Yes. So I did this little drawing because these two gentlemen walking around looking at, you like my artistic value? Um, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so these two guys, they don't see a house. They see dollar signs. Whereas you and I, when we look for a house to live, we're using the market data approach. We see the color blue. We see a pool. We see a, a beautiful kitchen. We see a comfy sofa. But when you're looking at income property, you don't see any of those things. All you see is a big dollar in front of that house, correct? Correct. Yeah. So to somebody who has go looking for income property, this is what they see. Just a bunch of items that look all the same. And they see all these numbers. So somebody says, here's the value of those homes. These numbers mean nothing to them. So if I want an income property, I see these numbers, 340 grand, you know, 940 doesn't mean anything to me. So then I see these numbers. These are the rental amounts. These don't mean anything to me either. So the way the house looks doesn't mean anything to me. The value of the house doesn't mean anything to me. And the rent prices don't mean anything to me. What does mean something to me and Kristen, you kind of said this. It's what? It's the money. It's the money. It's that price divided by rent. It's how the two of them relate to each other. On their own, they don't really mean anything. If you tell me a house is worth 10000 grand a year in rental, but it's a $5 million house, that's a bummer. But if you tell me that a house is worth hundred grand, i am like, ooh, good deal, right? 
So it's how it relates to that price. It's price divided by rent. This is a very loose way to do it, but it's a very quick way to do it, and it's really helpful. And once again, people say, what you learn for the exam is not relevant to what you actually do. You actually will do this, and you'll look very bad if you can't. It's a very simple estimate, price divided by rent. You should be able to do it in your head. You bust out your calculator function on your iPhone. I don't think anybody actually has calculators anymore, do they? I mean, come on, who cares around that? Um, so you go price divided by rent, you get the gross rent multiplier. Okay, so trick question here. 100 grand property, then brings in 10 grand a year in rent. What's the gross rent multiplier? 10,000. No. It's 10. 10. 10. Right. The gross rent multiplier of 10. That's an annual figure. Numbers from 5 to 20 tend to be annual. Okay? You're not going to see a, an annual gross rent multiplier of 100 or something like that. That would be ridiculous. That would be a horrible deal. So 100 grand divided by 20 grand give you a gross rent multiplier of 5. So the lower the gross rent multiplier, the better the deal is. If you get a hundred grand property that brings in 20 grand a year, that's a pretty good deal, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like crazy good. Um, okay. So a hundred grand divided by five grand is 20. Now this is still realistic, but that's not as good of a deal anymore. But you get the idea, when I put it into real numbers, you can see annual numbers are about 5 to 20. 100 grand divided by 5 grand equals about 20. 100 grand divided by, what was my other example? Um, 20 equals 5. So it gives you idea of where it sits. You could also do gross rent multipliers in monthly numbers. 100 grand property brings in $1,000 a month, gives you a monthly gross rent multiplier of 100. And it's important you guys notice this because I'm going somewhere with this. And people mess this up on the exam all the time. Okay? That's a monthly gross rent multiplier. Okay, so just to check on you guys, if I give you a gross rent multiplier of 100, am I doing monthly or annual? Monthly. 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 Right. Okay. All right, here we go. So here we have an issue. I tell you a $100,000 property mm -hmm. brings in $1,000 a month. All right, what's the gross rent multiplier? 100. Okay, so the monthly gross rent multiplier would be 100. But here's the catch. Are you ready? Yeah. I want an annual gross rent multiplier. So what are you going to do? Multiply times 12. Yes. Perfect. Awesome, Kristen. Multiply it by 12. So now you're working with annual figures. Okay. Huge that you did that because that's where people slip up in the exam a lot. And trust me, they'll give the option for the people who don't remember to multiply it times 12. And for the sake of saving us math, it'll be 8.3. So did you guys catch that? Yes. That's and that's bad. why I was saying it's important you recognize monthly gross rent multipliers and annual gross rent multipliers. And you understand the difference. So when you see numbers from 5 to 20, that's annual. If they see numbers from like 80 to 100, those are monthly gross rent multipliers. And you want to input the numbers. I don't know on your exam which number they're going to leave out. Could be that one, could be this one. But as long as you understand price divided by rent and you remember your eighth grade algebra, you'll be all right. Okay. All right, so what do you guys think the answer is here? See? Yes. There's my game show host. Yes. 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 <laughs> Annual rent in the selling price. Perfect. Good. Hallelujah. Um, yeah. 
All right, value. So if I ever do decide to charge for this, how much should I charge? One million dollars? What do you think? Five hundred thousand? Who knows? You guys don't have to answer that, right? <laughs> Sorry, that's awkward. But what we're talking about is my value. Okay. So there's four essential elements to value. Well, let me ask you guys this. Did you go over that in your studies, the four essential elements of value? Yes. What did you learn to help remember that? The acronym? Yeah. Dust. dust. So I'm going to give you a new take on that. All right. So you learned the acronym DUST. What is DUST? DUST. Dust is like not even dirt. It's not even like beach sand. There's like nothing good about dust. Why they use the example of dust, I will never know. Because in no way do I think value when I think of dust. Isn't dust something we hate? It gives people allergies and terrible things. I yes, prefer, like a stud. I prefer stud. But before I go there... Four essential elements of value, demand, utility, scarcity, transferability for all the boring old school people who insist on using dust. dust. Dust is dirty. Dust is gross. I like stud. Stud could be many things. Stud could be a dashing gentleman who's courting a lady. A stud could be a horse that is just incredibly, well, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and a stud is also a noun. This has value because it comes up on your exam. A large headed piece of metal that pierces and projects from a surface, especially for decoration. So in many samples, the word stud has value. Let's see who's been studying. What does stud stand for? Scarcity. Good. There's one. Transferability. Here, I'll just go through this. Utility. There he is. There you go. Demand, utility, scarcity, transferability. Now, the reality is, I was making fun of the word dust, but whatever helps you get through this. You can remember stud, dust, or tizada for all I care. You know, whatever helps. As long as you remember the four essential elements of value. Stud, scarcity, transferability, utility, demand. Dust, demand, utility, scarcity, transferability. And tizada. But <laughs> so my vowels are a little off of that one. Okay, demand. Anybody want it? Scarcity, is there a lot of it? Utility, can I use it? Transferability, can I sell it? Okay, demand, utility, scarcity, transferability. Dust. Stud, scarcity, transferability, utility, demand. Whatever works for you, okay? But you got to know those four essential elements of value. That is one of those you'll probably never see again after you pass your exam. So let's just memorize it, get through it, and get that license. So however it takes you to remember those four words, brings up my next picture. Paint this picture on your wall. Demand, transfer, utility, scarcity, demand, scarcity, utility, transferability, utility, scarcity, transferability, demand. You got to remember this one so you guys can get licensed. What's the answer to this one? B. Yes. B. Demand, you skill, <laughs> demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. Excellent. All right, depreciation, any loss in value of property over time. Pretty general term. So don't get too specific. It's any loss in value over time. There's different types of depreciation. Can you guys name any of them? Here's one. So you have functional obsolescence, economic obsolescence, and physical deterioration. Mm -hmm. Kristen, you heard of any of these before? Yes. Okay, good. So do, have you heard of them enough where maybe you could help define them for me? Sure. Okay, great. Give it a try. 
Okay, so um, starting out with functional obsolescence, it's uh, the loss in value to an, an improvement uh, resulting from functional problems caused by age or poor design. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to read Oh, yeah, you're reading. Okay. So, yes. So functional obsolescence means it's just not functional. One of the other reasons I said I really want to see you guys do on the appraisal because all the answers are in the name of the things. Market data approach, functional obsolescence, the functionality is obsolete. So if you have three cars and a one car garage in your house, it's not functional for you. If you have hip issues and you have trouble walking, having a three story house is not functional for you. So you get the idea. It has to do that it just doesn't work for you, okay? It's either poor design or it's just outdated. It's not functional, okay? So if you see two homes that were built at the same time right next to each other, on paper, square footage, location, everything, they look exactly the same, but they don't price out the same, what would be the cause? be like uh, a house with all of the bedrooms upstairs and a bathroom downstairs. Exactly. But that would be, you know, that's a perfect example. One, they may have the same rooms, two bed, two bath, but one has the bathrooms next to the bedrooms and one has the, the bathrooms in the basement and the bedrooms upstairs. So that would be functional obsolescence. Great example. Okay, so here we go. What's the answer? Good. And once again, for the people who are listening to this first time, obviously we know the answers because they come up right after I explain it. But I want to show the question so you can see the concepts we talk about in the form of questions. You can really get an idea. To really practice the questions, you got to go on the site and just bang them out as much as you can. All right, here we go. Here's another one. What do you guys think? Good. And the key here is build the same time, same cost, same everything. And that goes to your example. Well, something's wrong that we got to go see. Oh, that's where the bathrooms are? Well, that makes sense now. Next, we have economic obsolescence. Here's our pretty house with the bird chirping. Very nice, right? Yes. Uh-oh, gas station gets put in. Does that drop the value of your house? Yes. Yes. But, but the house is the same. Uh-oh, crime has come up, my little police car. The house is still the same, but the value is dropping. This is economic obsolescence. The value of your house's property is dropping due to causes extraneous to the property lines. Okay, and there comes a whole city around our perfect little house. So anytime your house loses value, Due to uh, things outside the property lines, economic obsolescence. This one's the most difficult to cure of them all. Because functional obsolescence, you redesign the house. You rebuild it. Physical deterioration, which we'll talk about in a second, that's just simple. You fix the repairs. If there is crime in your neighborhood that's getting out of control, what do most people do? Move. Move. They don't, they don't worry about the house anymore. They say it's a lost cause. This is the most difficult one to cure out of the three because most people will just move. Hey. Good. Last one, physical deterioration. This is the most obvious one. What's this one? The outside of the home is run down. Yeah, your house is falling apart. What you're going to hear on your exam is, and I'm just going to get to the point with this one, is wear and tear. Yeah, wear and tear. Did you see that on your exam? Yes. Good. Okay. So you'll see wear and tear. Um, deferred maintenance is another thing you'll hear on your exam. The other thing you may see is that this is not a form of obsolescence. 
the two forms of obsolescence are functional and economic. Okay? So you got to know physical deterioration is caused by wear and tear. Those are the key words you'll hear on your exam as well. All right, well, that's all for today. Thank you. This is Joe of realestatestudyaids.com. Till next time.